going to make some noise here. Touring has been a big part of my 30-year career in the music business. As a professional musician, I've spent my life on the road, driving the length and breadth of the country, as well as travelling abroad from venue to venue. But the success of the tour doesn't just depend on me hitting the right notes tonight, although, of course, that's important. What the audience don't see is the army of crew behind the scenes who put the tour together. Next! A big music tour can be the size of a small city, which up sticks every night and then takes to the road again. It's an incredible thing to be part of, but it's also, as I've realised over the years, a hermetically sealed bubble detached from the real world, and one which takes on its own reality. You know, you are hermetically sealed, you know, it's just kind of a week where you don't have to worry about picking up the phone or putting the washing on or, or relationships or anything. Pop singer Kim Wilde, still on the road today. And you don't even have to worry about checking into the airport or checking into the hotel or doing anything. I mean, it's just ridiculous. You know, you're treated like a child. But there's something rather lovely about that. Right now I'm performing with a handful of fellow artists who made our names in the 80s on the Here and Now tour. We're playing seven nights at different venues around the UK, ending up in London for a big night. We're standing in the middle of what was the Dome, which is the O2 Arena, and it's absolutely huge. The stage looks minuscule, uh, and it's quite a big stage. The stage looks tiny. It's a bit scary. Just, just I think that the physical size of it is, is scary, not the fact that you're going to go out there and perform in front of that many people, because I think most performers, if you know what you're doing, you're absolutely fine. If you're not sure of what you're doing, that's when you get really scared. We've got Jason doing a sound check right now, because all the artists have to do a sound check to make sure that they can hear themselves properly and make sure that the sound out front is good, because every artist gets a slightly different balance of what they want to hear. He's about to start. Here we go. The idea of this tour is to line up some old pop icons to bring a little 80s nostalgia back onto the stage. Performing alongside myself is Jason Donovan, Boy George and Belinda Carlisle. We all cut our teeth at a time when playing live was the best way to promote a new album. It didn't matter if the tour made money, it was a huge advert for the record. All the artists I know spent their early careers playing every sleazy club you could imagine. That was your music apprenticeship. These days you go on a television show and you become famous for 15 minutes and then you bypass that whole process. But I still think that going out on the road is where you learn how to control an audience and it's a test for any musician to perform live. This is Kim Wilde here. I'm a mother, wife, 80s pop star and um, passionate gardener. My career began with a bang with Kids in America when I was 20 years old and I'd barely done a gig in my life. Back in the day when technology was not as it is now, it was a lot harder to kind of emulate what you put on vinyl. And going out live, you were laying yourself bare and I felt very vulnerable. But I have to say, as a performer, I enjoy it a thousand times more now that I'm 50 than I did when I was 20. I think back in the 80s, you know, when you're 20-something, you're still trying to figure out who you are. And I found performing a bit of a trial for many years. Today, as music sales are declining due to online sharing, copying and downloading music for free at the touch of a button, the power has shifted from the record labels who own the recordings to the live music industry who own the events. Touring has become big business. Hi, my name is Dee, and I'm the tour manager. These days, I think it has become more professional because it had to become more professional. There are still the younger bands who like to party, you know, get on a bus and drink a bottle of Jack Daniels and wake up feeling sorry for themselves, but most times it's an appreciation of a good glass of wine and sit in the back lounge watching the video. But it's a wonderful job to have. A very wonderful job, you know. Mm. There's always the little mishap, like you get to the airport and you're standing in line, you're connecting all the passports from the band members and you go, uh, ah, 
I've left my passport in the safe at the hotel. It's an hour away, you know. So what about your relationship with us artists, Andy? Because you can almost become a kind of uh, parent figure on the tour, can't you? Organising everybody's lives and making sure that we all know what we're doing and where we're going every day. Um, you get close to musicians, and if they trust you and you get on well with them, then they end up you know, talking about private lives and problems and things like that. Mm. I mean, there have been instances in the past where people have written books about life on the road, after which they found it very difficult to get a job. You know, mm. if, if you work with somebody, there has to be mutual trust. For musicians of my generation, the template of a rock star we had was created by the excessive poet types like Jim Morrison and Jimi Hendrix. Being in a band, you were supposed to be an outrageous hotel-wrecking rock and roller who can stay up all night in the bar. Today, a new professionalism has entered the music industry and new templates for clean living artists have emerged like Sting, Beyonce, Chris Martin all take their health extremely seriously and prepare for their tours like prize athletes preparing for a big event. For myself and my contemporaries who have been through the high heady days of the 80s and perhaps suffered for it, for many of us the drink of choice backstage these days is a nice cup of tea. I'm Boy George, I sing a bit, I DJ a bit, and I'm backstage. Live touring now is so important for an artist like me because it's the last tangible thing that we have left. You know, there, there's no other thing that you can't download or steal. And if you can cut it live, you know, you can have a wonderful kind of experience on the road. So the reasons for it, I'm thinking about, you know, Culture Club, when you started touring. Were the reasons for touring then different from the reasons you tour now? I think more about improving what I do now. Whereas back in the day, it was like all kind of thrown at me. You took it for granted. Whereas now, I do have to kind of work at it. Mm. I don't go to the bar. You know, I mean, I don't sort of, I can sleep. I have to sleep. So that whole touring ethos that has changed drastically since the 80s to now, you know, in my day, we got the show out the way yeah. and then the proper fun started, yeah, no. you know, and all of that's all kind of changed now. Do you think, think things have gotten more professional in a way? What's important? Okay. People have paid to see my show, so maybe I shouldn't stay up till three in the morning, you know. I can't believe I did it for so long. Did you, <clears throat> you did it because you were allowed to do it? Because when you're famous and you're successful, you have a lot of people hanging on every word you say, so you're allowed to be badly behaved. Well, I think fame does kind of retard you. That's definitely true, and it keeps you in infancy. And I would say, in my case, a lot of my bad behaviour was about proximity, as you just said, you know, being around it, you know, whether it's a cake or a line of cocaine, it's like, don't put it in front of me, you know. So I've learned as I've got older that I'm an addict, you know, I can say that quite happily. And so I know that there are certain things I can't be around. So I don't drink or, or party in any way. And believe me, it's much better. When people say to me, what would you say to a new artist? I say, enjoy it. But they won't listen. They'll kick off about the bass drum. And I do that sometimes, but not all the time. But they have to kind of experience it, that diva-esque behaviour, you know, because we were all capable of it, and we all did it, you know, in And you day. just discover that actually... You know, it's hard work. And people laugh at you. You know, you, you want people to, that you work with to respect you. And, you know, I have to be honest and say, if you'd have told me I would sit here in 10 years ago and say I've grown up, you know, I would have been horrified by the idea of growing up. Ooh, what a vile thought. I'm so glad I have. <laughs> Right, I'm standing on stage here in amongst a sea of flight cases and a bunch of equipment and of course there's no point in asking me how this stuff works but I've got someone here who does. This is Gaz who looks after the backline uh, equipment for the artists. Yes. So yes. You, you basically kind of tune the guitars and make them uh, playable so that we don't have to think about that as artists. We just want to walk on and, and hit the thing and it just works. But you, you've, you've got to do all the hard work. Uh, yes, yes. All the artists have to do is just pick up the guitar and hit that chord. So, Gaz, how did you get into this crazy world of music touring? I was a failed musician, yeah. I toured in punk bands years and years ago, and, and then I just had enough, and I thought, I like the industry, I don't like playing, I, I've seen the tech, you know, and be part of the band, but not in the politics of the band. You can keep your independence and yes. not have all the pressures that a band would have about how many people yeah, coming in, exactly, does the tour make exactly, money, you know, exactly, all of the you know, all of the technical yeah. aspects of that. You're just worried about this is what you do, yeah. you do your job well, yeah. that's all you have to think yeah. about. Yeah. And the interesting thing is we can't do our jobs without each other. Exactly, yeah, that's it. You're only as good as each other, you know, and that's that's how it works. And it's nice, isn't it, like that? But I've worked with bands where they've treated me like 
rubbish. Get me this, get me that, you know, and you're like, hold on a minute, mate. You know, you've got to have a bit of respect and you just have to bite your lip and get on with it. Because it's such a hard environment, isn't it? You're all close-knit, you're going all over the world and you've got to get on. That's the key to a successful yeah. tour. It's yeah. not just about selling tickets. Yeah. It's about how you all get on because you're living with each other, you're a family. Yeah. yeah. Rock and pop concerts have come a long way since the days when the Beatles performed in boxing rings and hockey rings and made no greater demands of promoters than to be given clean towels and a few bottles of soft drink. In the unreal world of the music tour, it seems that the musicians' every wish is granted by concerts who are desperate to keep their talent happy. And so artists' lists of backstage demands, known as the rider, has taken on near-mythical status. Perhaps the most notorious rider belonged to the 80s rock band Van Halen, which called for a bowl of M&Ms backstage, but with all the brown ones removed. But according to them, this was to test whether the promoter had read the terms of the contract properly. So whether you think this is paying meticulous attention to detail or just downright diva behaviour, Van Halen's rider had a massive effect on the music industry. This is, this is my dressing hall. We do not demand a lot. We've got a little cool box here. We've got some waters and some fizzy drinks. Some nice desserty rice things, because they're not too fattening. Bit of fruit. So it's very, very simple. But then again, you walk into someone else's dressing room, and there'll be French champagne, and there'll be flowers, and, you know, the carpets have to be a certain colour, and, uh, you know, all of the nonsense that people demand. It's an ego thing. It's like a way of reassuring yourself that you are as important as you think you are. And unfortunately, you're the only person who thinks that. You know, the reality is people give you what you want because the bottom line is you end up paying for it. You can demand whatever you like. I want an elephant in my dressing room. And if you're a big enough star, you'll probably get that. But at the end of the tour, you'll get the bill. It goes with the stature that you feel you're at. This is where I feel I'm at right now. <laughs> oh, no, I'd do it. <laughs> so where's, no, my, where's my bowl of blue M&Ms? So as you can see, these days my rider is pretty modest. I asked Tony Denton, our tour promoter, if he'd ever encountered any more unusual requests in his career. Just a silly thing that comes to mind is when I was working with James Brown, so this was late 80s or early 90s, and the first show on the tour was in Birmingham, and I got a call from the tour manager, and he'd flown in, and he got to the hotel, and he had to have the presidential suite, and the thing that was stipulated in his rider was a hairdryer, and it was in bold, it was, he must have a hairdryer, right? <laughs> So, you know, because we're checking with the hotel to double check, he has his hair dry, and there's two. You know, there's one in this room, there's one in that room. Anyhow, the, the tour manager's on the phone saying, his road manager's at the venue going loopy. Mr. Brown is not going to come to the show. You haven't given him his hair dryer. What it turns out, what he meant by a hair dryer is not what you and I would blow dry our hair with. It's one of those grannies sitting, you know, where they have the blue the rings. Hood. Absolutely, <laughs> and it comes over his head. So one of the crew had to ring a local hairdresser in Birmingham. They had to send the tour bus round and screw it, take it in the bus to the hotel <laughs> so he could do his hair to come to the show. See, know? fortunately with me, you don't have you to don't worry have to. about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm sitting backstage in my dressing room with the lovely Belinda Carlyle here. How's the tour been for you so far? Easy peasy. Easy. Middle of the bill. Go to bed right after my set. I'm tucked in bed with my book and the bowl of Special K by 9 o'clock. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> That's how much it's changed. <laughs> what about the difference in the professionalism from touring back then to, to the way it is now? Because it's, it's much more... A refined business now, isn't it? Well, it is business. Plus, I can't possibly do the same pace. Back then, we were in a van with the road crew in like a 12-passenger van with equipment and, and suitcases. So it's a whole other thing. Now, you know, I'm, I'm 52 and 7 eighths. I'm eking it out. <laughs> <laughs> eking out that 52. I, I can't really do three in a row anymore. I find my voice can't do that. And so it's pacing is all important and health is important. 
It's the antithesis of the old rock and roll lifestyle. Absolutely. The excess that, that everyone went through back in the day, and now it seems to be the opposite end of the scale. Well, I, I, believe me, I've, I, I had plenty of those days too. So now it's kind of nice to do it a different way. <laughs> Not so much rock and roll, more kind of roll into bed at the end of exactly. the night. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Right now, I am going into Belinda Carlisle's room to give her her drinks, her wine. Outside the dressing rooms, I found Carly Lewis from the catering crew putting out the riders. I followed along to have a cheeky nose into my fellow performer's backstage secrets. Now hold on, Belinda's got a lot more in her rider than I've got in mine. <laughs> she's got wine glasses. Special cat. And she's got fan mail, I don't get fan mail, what's going on? Jams, mustard. Basil, tomatoes. Oh, getting jealous now. I'm getting jealous. I wouldn't know what to do with it all. Because everyone gets one of these lovely big cool boxes on wheels. Yeah, she's got um, some soft drinks, just a little pint of milk, and, and some water. Four, yeah, four big bottles of water. I'll take two out, keep my room temperature, and two in. Because room temperature water is good for the horse. See there, as we hold. I should learn this stuff. <laughs> Later, I discovered that the crew have a few secrets of their own. Sound engineer Jeff Curtis was in charge. This is for the Mouse Cheese and Wine Club. There's four glasses here, and uh, at four o'clock we have a platter of cheese and biscuits come out, and we have a, a half a glass of wine each. And how how civilised? You've, you've got your own little mini bar yeah. here and a flight just, case. <laughs> evolved over the years. That, a platter of cheese and biscuits, half a glass of wine each, one bottle between four or five of us. And, and a set of cricket weights. <laughs> that's my cleaning equipment for the glasses. Are you enjoying yourselves? I soon put a stop to that. I'm in my salubrious dressing room here with the lovely Martin Kemp. Martin, you have been touring the world for the last 25, 30 years. Is touring a necessary thing? Um, I'm not sure it's necessary. I think it's necessary to have a lot of fun. It's the most fun you can have in your lifetime. I, I've had more fun in dressing rooms, backstage, horrible dressing rooms than you can ever imagine. I, it's... Fantastic. You go out on your tour bus, you're looked after by everybody, and you're protected from everything. You don't see a gas bill, an electric bill, and you're away from real life. It's lovely. Unfortunately, all those bills are waiting for you yeah. when you get home. What about backstage demands? Yeah. You know, only the music industry would ask for you know, ridiculous demands backstage. Yeah, I mean, we, we went completely over the top. I think maybe about 1985, Spandau Ballet completely lost their heads. Maybe at that point we were up there close to some, one of the biggest bands in the world. Not the biggest band, but up there amongst them. And we had a minder each, we had a rider from hell, I don't know, ten bottles of Jack Daniels, crates and crates of champagne, and every time you turn up, it was there every night. So the bigger you get the more excess you expect you know but it was the 80s and the 80s was an era of excess and so should the rider be so, but listen I, everything we did and how mad it got i'm glad it did because uh, you know i can stand here now and say yeah all right i did that but then we sort we got to the top and then we came down again I remember doing a television show with you guys in Germany. Because we used to do a lot of TV shows together. Yeah, we, we were did, on the yeah, same yeah. label. We flew on a few private planes We did together, fly on a few we? planes yeah. together. But there was one TV show in particular where at the end of the performance, I swear on my life, I saw Spandau Ballet trash the we equipment. We did, and it's so embarrassing. We, did, we absolutely <laughs> did do that. But when we were 17, that's what we aspired to. We wanted to do that because that was all part of the package of being a rock star. And that's what you, you aim at. But once you're there and you've done it, and then you kind of realise, hang on, you can only do it for so long, you've got to come down the other side. I think the other realisation is that you're paying for it all as well, yeah, which is crazy. of course, of course. <laughs> but at the time, it doesn't matter, you know, when you're 20 and you've aimed at this, if you get an opportunity to do it, wow, man, you've done it. Did the house lights actually, did that get all sorted, yeah? Trent. Nikki Eid is a production manager on the tour. She looks after the artists and crew, and it's her job to make sure that everything runs smoothly. I've never seen Nikki sit still or even finish a meal. There's always someone requiring her attention. I wondered how she coped with the 18 hour days and the constant demands of the tour. Your just adrenaline keeps you going because you know it, you know, half past seven when house lights go down, that's it. 
and so everything has to be done by then. And then you do tend to relax a bit when house lights go down because you think, well, we've done all we can here. Let's get the show on the road. So what about when you got onto the tour bus at 2 a.m. after the show? Can you go to sleep and still wake up fresh the next day? Oh, I sleep like a baby on the bus. It's better than any hotel. <laughs> um. You don't get a chance to share a hotel with 12 men very often. No, you but don't, actually. on the bus, you, you're sharing it with all these grumpy, hairy, and smelly all, men. And I love them all very dearly. You have to. <laughs> and you normally have bruises on your knees, on your elbows and on your forehead because you bang your head all the time. <laughs> you're quite tall, so I mean, it's hard enough for me getting in that bunk, but uh, for you it must be particularly difficult trying to... You know, negotiate getting clothes on and off. You can learn very quickly. <laughs> on this tour, the crew sleep on a 14-sleeper tour bus. Luckily, I get to stay in hotels. Although I have slept in a tour bus, and I know what it's like. Kind of like a cross between being on a TARDIS and a submarine. You go to bed at night in this little cabin, and you wake up every morning in a completely different place. So as you walk in... So I'll leave you in the safe hands of Gaz or Guitar Tech to give you a magical mystery tour of this crew bus. As you, yeah, so as you come in on the bus and then you turn left, there's a stairwell, which, which is this, like the sleeping area, uh, which is basically it's a thin corridor with bunks on either side. And, and then there's like a... Uh, right at the front of the bus, as you come down, it smells quite nice, actually. It's not too bad, because some buses, you know, I've been on it for a long time. It's like, you know, it's a bit pongy. This is my bunk here. You've got some, like, bit of air con here, which is on your left, so you just get some air blowing in. You have a light there. It's, I don't know, it's about six, six foot in length and about four foot wide. So it's like a coffin, really, at the end of the day, with curtains. <laughs> so what are we doing? Are we waiting for the sound check or are we doing that? On most tours I've ever been on, the catering area is at the heart of the tour. Artists and crew gather to eat and catch up and gossip in a neutral space. But it always astonishes me how the caterers manage to build a kitchen from scratch at every venue we play at and feed around a hundred people three meals a day every day. This is the lunch catering area. There's a, a huge kitchen <laughs> has appeared. You know, industrial catering size, kind of cauldrons, you know, bubbling away. There's the old adage about, you know, an army marches on its stomach. Well, this is an army, and they all have to be fed. So catering is the highlight of everybody's day. In the backstage kitchen, I met caterer Kat Horsley to get the lowdown on how she keeps the artists and crew happily fed on the tour. Uh, this is our pie lids for our steak and Guinness pies. Steak and Guinness yeah. pies. Fantastic. Nice and low fat for you. <laughs> <laughs> is that something you have to kind of take into consideration? The fact that you got a bunch of artists who are all incredibly, stupidly vain and <laughs> don't want to don't want to get too fat, and they don't want you know great big heavy stodgy yeah, meals all the time. Sometimes, and we sometimes, and we always make sure we've got a fish or something light on the menu as well, so you've got another option. So you've got everything that you'd need. So basically, you're a you're a completely and utterly mobile restaurant content, because it's not yeah. just the cooking. You're coming up with the tables and the knives and forks yeah. and the plates and the soup bowls and the terrines. Exactly. And you've got to carry absolutely everything with you. Yeah, absolutely everything. And so we just bring all our ovens in, in flight cases and fridges and things like that and just load in however many we need. Do all the eggs have little flight cases of their own? <laughs> yeah, they do, Little yeah. individual flight cases <laughs> for each egg. <laughs> you do need that sometimes. So what about when you're in the middle of deepest, darkest Europe yeah. and you've run out of courgettes and you've no idea where you are and you've got to go out and find a fresh vegetable market. Yeah. How do you do that? Well, if you're lucky, you've got a runner that's knowledgeable, that knows the area. So, local, um, someone local, A local yeah. runner, yeah. So, and then, luckily, they uh, quite often speak English, so you can kind of, or you can show them one and say, this, I need ten of these or whatever. <laughs> For us, glamour is the sweat on your brow or the dirt on your hands. Tony Lawson, chairman of the tour catering company Eat to the Beat, talked me through the skills you need to do the job properly. You have to be prepared to lift flight cases, push those boxes, get a sweat on, clean things properly. And if you're not prepared to do that, this isn't the job for you. Today you're cooking in a toilet backstage. Great. Tomorrow you're cooking in a shower. <laughs> and sometimes if you hit the button, the shower goes off. <laughs> and the next day you're in a beautiful kitchen. So the ability to 
design and build a mobile kitchen every day in a different surrounding, use the space you've been given, and a degree of common sense really seriously helps. So see, this is pretty dodgy. Well, you, you have got yours on particularly dodgy setting. Yeah, well, I'm going to change that. Well, After his sound check, I caught up with Jason Donovan in his dressing room. I wanted to hear what he thought had changed since he first went out on the road in the 1980s. Well, as you and I know, it, it's all based on currency, you know, and it depends on the currency of the artist. I, I, I'd be very honest here. Now, you know, I, I came into this country on a red carpet. It was a rather sort of odd way to sort of start my touring life. You know, I started at Wembley <laughs> and got very confused somewhere in between. So it's, it's quite difficult for me to sort of say. Personally, I, I still get anxious, you know, after 20... 30 years of doing it now. I think what you can do as you become more experienced is learn to work with your anxiety. You know, there's a lot of pressure. I think the higher up the food chain you are, the greater the pressure. I've actually found that not being <laughs> up the chain as high as is, 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 is... Success is not always the key to happiness, you know. Happiness is the key to success. That's probably the best way of sort of describing it, you know. I like to think of these shows as one night stands. You turn up and it's there, you turn up the next night and it's gone. It's moved on somewhere else. And that's the magic about what happens on tour. Musicians are Peter Pans. We don't grow up, we grow old, but we don't really grow up. We don't really want to grow up. That's why we call it playing. You know, we're playing music, we're playing it touring. It's not real life and it's not life or death, it's just entertainment. Are you dancing? And if you live in that bubble long enough, you don't have to think about the reality of it all. For that little moment in time, you're untouchable, unattainable and living in that fantasy world that you've created. And people indulge you in that. They buy the ticket and come and see you perform which allows you to do it all over again another day. Thanks for the match. Enjoy the rest of the evening. I'll see you soon.